Uh, thanks all for coming. So, I know Ted <coughs> just said that I think differently than he does, um, but I have this fervent belief that artists are no different uh, than anybody else. There is no other, any otherness. We all think differently from each other, for sure. Um, but I guess art is work. And uh, I've been delving into it, and I hope, uh, hope you delve into it too. So this is not a lecture, per se. Uh, I certainly can't talk about art. I, I certainly cannot describe or define or tell you what it is. Um, I would really love all of your thoughts at any moment, at any time, as loud, as obnoxious as you want to be, uh, <laughs> to, to interrupt me at any point, really, 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 and ask questions and do whatever. Um, yeah, so. My practice is based in philosophy. I went to school at Wesleyan, uh, where I went for music first, playing jazz, and then I was a Chinese philosophy major until as long as I possibly could be before I decided, well, I can't possibly do that. Uh, I have to do art and architecture. So philosophy has continue to play a huge role in what I do. I think most of my projects are examples of philosophy. Um, part of the reason why I didn't do a philosophy major was because I couldn't do anything but write an essay that wouldn't let me do an installation, for example. But everything that I do is a philosophical paper in one way or another, but it's a project in some other medium. Um, I think everything in the world is. Everything has a hidden ideology, or not so hidden, but certainly is representative of something deeper, and a meaning is there. Uh, this is a quote that I love. Perhaps you've read by, the, by now. Um, Everything that falls upon the eye is apparition, a sheet dropped over the world's true workings. The nerves and brains are tricked. And one is left with dreams that these specters loose their hands from ours and walk away, the curve of the back and the swing of the coat so familiar as to imply that they should be permanent fixtures of the world, when in fact nothing is more perishable. I love this quote. This is from Housekeeping. Um, the idea that you know we take reality to be firm and true and real, and in fact, perhaps it's a little more imagined than we think. What isn't it? Isn't it the statistic that there's a delay? between the real world and the brain by something, some calculable amount of time, that we are in fact not even experiencing the world in real time. There is no such thing. Um, and I, lo I love that. And here's from a completely different perspective. This is um, Boris Breuz, who is this yeah, German, uh, German professor at uh, NYU. Um, all things can be seen from an aesthetic perspective all things can serve as, as, uh, as sources of aesthetic experience and become objects of aesthetic judgment. Art has no privileged position. Art becomes between the subject of the aesthetic attitude in the world. A grown person has no need for art's aesthetic tutelage and can simply rely on one's own sensibility and taste. Aesthetic discourse, when used to legitimize art, effectively serves to undermine it. <laughs> What's pretty? What's beautiful? It's all so subjective to me, and I think aesthetics could be sort of pushed more towards ethics. Um, Boris here goes on to say in his book um, that on the other side of the coin from aesthetics is poetics. It's sort of looking at the world from the point of view of the producer. Of course, I'm sure I had that quote somewhere later in the presentation. Um, but I like that idea. To me, this was a big turning point, reading this book of his book, Going Public. Um, it was a very interesting text about how to approach things. Um, 
So we will get to some pictures. Um, this is woefully uh, not quite as vibrant as the image, but this is a shooting range in Cairo, New York. Um, and it's sort of this wild uh, landscape, really. And so there are three parts of this talk, roughly. And you can tell I'll be out of order the whole time. But uh, <laughs> the first part is thinking about viewing the world with sensitivity. I was talking with Ted uh, originally and sort of through this and with Gloria about ways to sort of direct the talk, uh, the input uh, of the world on a person, I think is a very important thing to talk about. Um, if you're thinking about an artist, you know, viewing the world with sensitivity is something that uh, I think is very important. Um, I went up to Cairo, New York with a bunch of friends a couple of years ago, and we rented a mansion. There were maybe 12 of us, and basically my friends had an idea to just get hammered and do drugs and have a great party, and, um, and they did that. And it was tiring and hilarious and fun, and on the way down, uh, Jack, my friend, suggested that we go shooting at the shooting range in Tuxedo Park. And I sort of wasn't into it, but everyone was in very, very adamant um, and to me, this place was very strange. Everyone there was so relaxed. I'm extremely on edge, surrounded by 12 gauge shotguns and rifles and handguns and bullets and people of all ages hanging out around these weapons, completely calm. And there's a lot of safety in that calm. They all know what they're doing. But it still seems crazy to me that they're all drawn together for this thing. We step on onto the range, bathed in fluorescent clay pigeons. I mean, these are like high visibility vest color uh, in real life. And I just thought it was so excessive, but my turn comes and then, you know, I grew up as a boy in America, and so I am into this kind of thing a little bit. And, you know, clay pigeon, pull, 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 pull. I am shaking with adrenaline. It is unbelievable. It's immediately a love relationship. You know, I want to destroy all of these orange discs. <laughs> it's, it's about physics, it's about understanding action at a distance, it's about pure intentions, it's about not hesitating, it's about all of these incredible things. Um, and it's ridiculous to me still, but I completely get it. I completely get it. I think when you're looking at something from the outside, it's a very different experience than being on the inside of something. And I guess the goal with a lot of things that I do is to try to get inside of whatever the experience is, whatever the process is. And I think the same can be done for looking at art, or looking at anything, really, looking at the world. The whole world is art. The whole world can be an aesthetic experience or a source of that. Um, so this shooting range holds a very uh, special position in my heart. If, only for its metaphorical qualities. <laughs> there are more images in the world than there are viewers. There are uh, more images uploaded to Facebook every day than there were in the world in the year 1900. Every single day. And, and of course, photography was relatively nascent. Uh, in the year 1900, but still, that's a lot of photographs, and it just shows the you know, the acceleration of our production of images. Everything is cataloged. Every important event and every unimportant event is cataloged with images online. And so, how do you how do you navigate this wash of images and objects and beautiful things uh, and ugly things and grotesque things, but interesting things? Um, <laughs> So this, this comes from a series uh, called AdWords, which is a collection of advertising propaganda images rearranged. Their words rearranged to mean other things. This is sort of my favorite of the series. One by one, get free. Um, it's a great slogan. When you say it out loud, it really sounds like it's a great slogan. Mm -hmm. like, um, so this was up uh, at South Street Cafe. I had, um, earlier in the year, last year, last year. Um, and it was on the wall, and 
50% of the people who walked in said, so what do I have to buy to get one thing free? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that we all do this. I do this a lot. You sort of scan something, you know. You're scanning the whole world. Everything's coming by very, very quickly. And there's so much to look at. There's so much to understand. Uh, and so a little subtle subversion of that, I think, is always very healthy. Uh, so this is the first video. That, to me, is unbelievably interesting. <laughs> Maybe that's a funny thing, but... That's a miraculous moment, in some way. Because it's this... The, the plane of understanding, uh, or the sort of plane of reality in front of you. I'm not going to go describe it and all, but... Um, I just find that fascinating. There is quite a lot. It's also a fascination with boats. This is this is a um, this is a cruise ship parked in front of Eureka, California, in a bay. Uh, and the cruise ship, I thought at first was just a normal cruise ship, maybe people get on. And I was at the cafe in Eureka, and someone was saying, oh yeah, the condo boat is in here again. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean? What is it, of a condo? They're, yeah, it's a collection of condos on this boat. Uh, and they're all like multi-million dollar apartments, these giant, giant things. Uh, the boat is called The World. And people have timeshares, or they just have their floating house on this boat, which they get to take around the world. Which I found to be absolutely staggering. So this is, this is the first image in a series uh, called America, Is That You? Uh, which is documentation of a road trip, a uh, five month road trip that I took in 2012. Um, and is nothing if not an explanation of how I see America. Could you go, you said being more sure son of doctors. Did you go back to the previous one that you got so fascinated by? This? No, the one right there. Why are you so, why are you so fascinated by it? Um, <coughs> no, I'm, thank you for interrupting. Uh, these cruise ships uh, have been popping up in strange moments in my life. Um, and that was part of the reason why I started taking this video. Um, I don't know, they seem to appear when a camera is perfectly set <laughs> in these amazing ways. Uh, a friend of mine and I have this sort of ongoing dialogue with uh, sending each other videos of these huge cruise ships. Um, partly what's fascinating to me is scale. Um, here we are in Seattle, and this boat is, because of the depth of field, very small in relation to these people. Uh, but it's the size of these apartment buildings, if not bigger. And we're moving at a constant velocity here on this ferry. And um, 
there's a thing in, in physics uh, where if you're at a constant velocity, you don't know that you're moving. Or you know, if, if there's absolutely no rumble and shake and jumble and whatever, a constant velocity feels like you're at rest. In fact, that is the definition of being at rest. We are all moving at 768 miles per hour or whatever it is through space all the time. Uh, but it feels like we're at rest. Um, and so that gets at a couple of different things uh, in a very simple way, it seems. I don't know. It's, hopefully that answers. Yeah. Well, I, what I thought was interesting, it, it really looked like the background was a whole other film that you had projected mm -hmm. behind there. Right. It didn't look like this actually happened in real life. It was just yeah. these two entities that yeah, put together. Yeah, that, that guard drill yeah. definitely makes mm -hmm. it seem like mm -hmm. far away. Yeah, a green screen. Reality is a green screen. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I thought maybe the fascinating thing was the land was moving, the boat was sitting still. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that constant mm -hmm. velocity. Yeah. It reminds me of two films, um, a little bit of uh, Foodies and the Ship Sails On. Yeah. And oh, there's an old Japanese film called The Island that has no speaking parts to it. It just tells a story. It's an old, gritty, black and white film. And it's just the, the story of the people every morning they get out and they get on their boat and they sail to row over to that other island to get the water to come to water the plants. And they have to do that several times a day. And but the the it's the quietness and the tone that you had running behind the uh, yeah. the video reminded me of that almost it becomes almost a meditation. Yeah. Cool. Great, I want to check that out. So I'm going to I'm going to move on to more images from around the country. This is at New Orleans Jazz Fest. I was looking the whole time for that perfect American ranch house, <laughs> you know, that, that stereotypical thing. And here it was. And yeah, I don't know if you can see, but this is a, a family of fake deer. Oh. <laughs> for and it, they had. Uh, arrows in them for you know bow hunting practice. Oh. Where is this? That's in uh, Jennings, Louisiana. And the best crawfish I have ever had. This huge crawfish boil there. This is at um, the Gila National Monument. Gila National Forest. This is the, the cliff dwellings, which have been inhabited for which were inhabited for ten thousand years. Um, and there are constructed remains of, of structures inside the cave that are, I think, about 2,000 years old. But it's become this just image creation spot. <laughs> uh, and I, found, I thought this was amazing. Like, you need a sign to tell you <laughs> when to take your picture, where to take it. I was there about 15 or 20 years ago, and fortunately, they didn't have Oh, yeah. <laughs> Those then, choose it's, your own adventure at that yeah, point. Yeah. An amazing place. And a, an incredible place. Yeah. 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 Magical. Mm. And right next to the cliff dwellings, this is the fifth largest open pit mine in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a porta potty. Uh, <laughs> should give you a sense of things. Mm. Yeah, this is in uh, New Mexico near Silver City. And I guess. It's mostly iron ore, but also sand and also gravel, all kinds of things. It smelled there. It smelled like, it smelled like metal there. Yeah. Mm. Outside of Dallas, Texas. Another shot from... No, this was some festival, some other festival. This is a bridge. This actually might be a bridge at Madison County. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think it's possible. This is in Washington State. So, what what struck me driving around the United States is how different everything is. That you know we live in this giant country that is in fact so disparate. Regions change. The topography changes. People change. Customs change. But 
there is enough of a through line that it can be called a country, but it just seems so big, so, so preposterously large. Uh, and so seeing these sort of images of people lost in the landscape kind of interested me. A failed crawfish eating attempt, I think. <laughs> This is in Luray, Virginia. Unbelievable caves, stalactites and stalagmites everywhere. And, and, uh, and this garbage can. <laughs> uh, you know, itself a little cave to throw your garbage into. The Bay in California, which is just one giant metropolis. It's wild, absolutely wild. This is the, the cliff dwellings. This guy um, is 84. Uh, you have to climb a lot to get to the cliff dwellings. Uh, and he has been volunteering at this site for 60 years. Maybe you had him as a guy, I don't know. <laughs> he, he, uh, I was there in the winter, so I had it pretty oh, okay. much to myself, but it was great. Cool. Yeah, he's summertime. Exactly, summertime. But he comes, does it for free. He's been doing it for 60 years. It's incredible. Lost Creek, Austin, Texas. <laughs> Something about seeing new hipsters in this sort of idyllic, endless landscape is fascinating. Uh, not fascinating, hilarious to me. <laughs> oh, monument. Again, this image is. There's a great book by a photographer, I forget his name, but it's called Watching People Watching. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's shots of people in places, mm -hmm. mostly tourists, just looking or taking photographs of. And I think it's sort of what we do more than anything else these days, is, is watch, look, and take in. Uh, and I guess, yeah. maybe in that, I was just wondering if you felt the need to respond in any other way than capturing Doing drawing the, in the sand. The trip? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I did a lot of drawing. I did a lot of, uh, did a lot of, uh, took a lot of videos, created, created a series of videos about what it is, which is similar to photography in a way, a lot of way. Um, but, uh, but the action of going across the country and the way that I was doing it and who I was doing it and what I was doing seemed like a, an active thing, yeah. This is a bunker from World War II on the, on the shore of New Jersey. <coughs> Pine Barrens of New Jersey. I did not place this here. I found this here, I swear. This lazy boy just in the middle of this forest. It's like something horrible that happened there. It's like some mafia horrible thing. <laughs> and DC, Washington, DC. FBI. It was close. I don't know I don't know what this I think this may have actually been just a museum. Forget. So to talk about artists versus others, we, think we, we separate science and art a lot. Um, and obviously the amount of craft and the sort of technique changes. You go to different training, you, you understand different things, but sort of at the, at the highest level of everything. Uh, we have Sivas Demopoulos, who, when he works on a paper uh, in physics, in particle physics, he only allows two other people to work on it with him because you can only share a Nobel Prize three ways. And every single one of his papers is at that level. Um, he's trying, you know, he's really trying to work at that super high level. Um, and I think it's, ex it's exciting to me to, to hear him talk about scientists uh, that, di that differentiate scientists as an artistic ability to, to discern what's a good idea, what's a beautiful idea, what's worth spending time on. And this timing thing is very important. That, hasn't yet been solved, but it's time to solve it now. I was just reading something today by Dr. Amak Kaiswami, mm -hmm. who is teaching physics, and you know, the, the whole idea that subatomic particles are everywhere. They can be two or three places yeah. where they're once. Yeah. This is the creativity. 
Yeah. You know, businesses like that. You know, right? Totally. And I think it becomes like, uh, it becomes similar to philosophy, <coughs> or all things become similar to philosophy if you take them far enough. According to the strange in the daily, I think it's certainly something that I find at the core. <laughs> so this is uh, Sam. This is Sam. He is a bush. Uh, this is from Bushes of Eddington County, which is a photographic catalog of bushes and shrubs in Eddington County. And it started as a joke with a couple of friends of mine. Actually, the same friend that I send the, the cruise ship videos back and forth with. Uh, we have this thing, right? these bushes and tree men that we see everywhere. These, these trees that are anthropomorphic, you know. And so I sent, I sent a picture of some bush, I don't know, I don't remember which one, to him and my friend Jake and uh, Sam. I sent it to Sam. And Jake, and this is named after Sam. Uh, ha ha, I have a new series called Bushes of Bennington County, which is based on Bridges of Madison County, which I've never seen, but. Uh, and it became this running joke, and then uh, I was talking with Jamie Franklin, who gave a talk here last week. Uh, it's a curator of the Bennington Museum. I was going to have a show, or I wanted to have a show, and I said, I was showing you my work, and I said, You know, I have this series, and it's kind of a joke, but I know you're interested in Bennington, and it's called Bushes of Bennington County, and I don't know. And he said, you have to do it. You have to. And at that point, I had eight photographs, you know? It wasn't a real, it wasn't a real series. Um, but once he egged me on, it became a whole lot more. <laughs> they're so personal. They have so much personality. Because, I mean, they're shaped by a personality by a human being, and they represent all of our interest, all of our neglect. Uh, I think if you take it further, they're, they're symbols of <laughs> a deeper societal structure uh, and tradition coming from Italy to England to here, how we deal with landscape, how we <coughs> objectify it and make it what we want whatever our aesthetic desires may be. And they're, they're interesting. They're these sculptures that people spend so much time on, and very few people look at them. And uh, <laughs> this is Jacob. <laughs> if you want to go see it in person, it's outside of the KFC Taco Bell. <laughs> it's incredible. It changes colors. Sort of, yeah, obviously, every once a year, <laughs> every once in a while, throughout the year. Yeah, they're all kind of they're they're all kind of sad too. Yeah. They're funny, but ultimately becomes this sort of sadness. Yeah, you get the sense they planted it in this big. Did not think it would do so well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a huge one. This is maybe 15, 10, 15 feet tall, 12 feet tall. What are their names? Thing one and thing two. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't named all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's to hide uh, uh, an exhaust fan from the basement of Cinema 7. <laughs> it's just sitting right there. And, and so they made it like this, but just in case someone would back over. <laughs> I mean, it just, it's all of these things, there, there are so many layers to all of the, there's an implied event to every single one of these. And tons of events implied. Um, so the show ended up at the Venice Museum, and it came out very nicely. Uh, and I wanted to show you a bit of the process of how it went from just observing the world to 
creating an installation in a museum. Uh, this is a great. If one is involved in a project, or more precisely, is living in a project, one is already in the future. One is working on something that cannot yet be shown to others, that remains concealed and incommunicable. The project transforms the present into a virtual future, causing a temporal rupture between oneself, oneself and those who will wait for the future to happen. We're all in projects like this all the time, planning something, bringing it to fruition. It doesn't exist until it does, but in our minds, it is totally realized. This is great. I just saw this wonderful cartoon uh, of, it's called What It's Like to Be an Artist. And it's a guy sitting at a desk. You know, he's walking around. He's got this image of this like tiger. And, he's, and the tiger is flushed out. It's amazing. doing all this stuff, man. Super realistic. And then he's eating. And it's still in his head. And it's doing all the things. And it's, it's perfectly flushed out. And, you know, really, really ornate and serious. And then it's him at his desk. And he's, He's drawing and it's like a stick figure and he's, you know, starts crying. <laughs> and I think, I think that relates, in my mind, to what I do. You know, you have, you have these wild, wild dreams of what something is. And transferring it and translating it to the real world becomes very, very difficult. Um, interpreting what it is that you dream of is very hard. Uh, so... A, a bunch of ugly photographs of, of things being made. Uh, so, to build that wall, first I built it in my studio, framed it, made it modular, mocked it all up, did it all, took it apart, threw it in the car, blah, blah, blah. Very simple. The bushes is about trolling through thousands and thousands of images uh, of bushes, editing each one for screen and then for print, uh, and then calling them down to about 200, printing those, then doing an edit with the actual photographs. Uh, and so it became like trimming in this <laughs> crazy way, you know? Thousands and thousands of things cut down and then shaped perfectly and arranged and put together. And so uh, it was a very coffee ass moment there to be a part of it, and then ultimately shown as simply as possible on shelves, which I feel like would mimic uh, a road in a way. You know, they're lined up in a kind of road, and so you would walk past in a similar way. And you could scan, or you could spend as much time with each one as possible, um, but the scale is right for them this way. Very small. These are three by five. Um, so they become these little objects, and the, the shadows cast on the wall really brings them out. Uh, and then the large, there were a few large prints, so I also in the same vein made, tons of, made six frames, mounted them, and then installed the museum, uh, and ended up being an installation. Um, all of that work, all of that activity that goes into it is, is, I guess, behind the scenes in a way. But in fact, that action of being an artist <laughs> of whatever it is. It's sort of like this long performance piece that you do. Uh, it, it's a continuous cycle. And, and one could extend it to living as a person, everyone. Uh, everyone living, everyone doing what they do. You doing what you do today, yesterday. I think it is, can be a created, a manifested project in the same way that an art installation can be. Um, I'm not saying you have to be theatrical or, or huge or whatever, you, whatever it is, whatever you feel like is most you. Um, I think it is, it's, it's worthwhile of any institution, um, but it happens in a context that we call reality, that we call the real world. So, we're well into the second uh, section of this talk <laughs> about the process of creating, like pushing something out, create, you know, input and now an output. Um, you can't just observe, obviously. You, it has to be between a continual flow between states of engagement and disengagement. It provides potential and allows us to understand the why of production 
as opposed to the what. I'm going to show you a bunch of videos now, which were part of the show uh, at the Bennington Museum and are now up in Burlington, Burlington City Arts. Um, this is called Rot. So a lot of my sculpture that I make is, is uh, incredibly balanced, very, very delicately balanced. And slowly but surely, they all fall apart. And they were getting, I, I was really pushing them to move towards falling apart more and more and more. You know, but they would fall apart more quickly. Uh, they would be up for 24 hours or 72 hours or whatever it was. And finally decided, well, I might as well just start videotaping, like just in case something happens. Uh, and this, I don't know how or why it took that perfect amount of time to fall, but I think it had something to do with the electricity running through that extension cord to power the TV. Um, I turned, you know, with the TV off, it was standing for whatever, I turned on the TV and in fact it, it fell. Um, which is sort of this miraculous moment. And for me, it's a break from creating static objects uh, and moving towards, or not, not ending creating static objects, just a move towards a larger vocabulary of possible ways to make sculpture. And in fact, these can be sculptural events um, that everything's moving all the time. Why not make something uh, that is in this way? This is another, uh, another piece from that show. This one's called Knock Yourself Out. long I was looking for a tiny little ice skating rink. <laughs> <laughs> so I finally found it. I went up to the, uh, when I went up to uh, the owner of the house and I said, can I ice skate in your front lawn? <laughs> she, she looked at me like I was nuts <laughs> first and then said, Sure, knock yourself out. Which <laughs> was like exactly what I didn't want to do. <laughs> this is called lumber.
is quite a long one. Okay, let's get forward. Getting this board to stand up on its own was <laughs> so hard, so hard to do. Um, Virginia, um, I went down to an artist residency in Virginia, and everyone asks at the dinner table, so what do you do? And I guess word got around that I was a painter, um, and I don't really paint all that much, um, but I always said yes, when everyone knew it, so that I'm a painter. Yes, yes, I am. Are you a painter? And um, because why not? Yes, I am. <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, and they had this program there called, that was a permanent collection, and you could uh, donate a work to their permanent collection. Uh, and it was mostly sculpture and prints and paintings, and so they would use it to fundraise. They would, you know, they would auction off and donate work. It's a great place, you know. They just, you, know you don't have to pay to go, and it's very nice. And so I decided I would try to donate something, but I, I decided that I wanted to be a little smarmy and donate a performance piece. Um, so, this was the result. Something that 
I feel a lot, that I think a lot of artists feel a lot. Someone asks you what you're working on, or what it is that you do, uh, and it's very hard to describe. No matter what it is that you're doing, it's very hard to describe, because you're living in that future space, that future time. You know, you can't communicate it. It's very, or maybe you can, but just a little bit. Uh, I love this quote because it's it's like it's armor in a way. It's like here, take this shield. You know, you can use it. You don't have to say. You don't have to say. Um, yeah, I think the continuation is it, it's a thread. It comes out at its own pace. So how do you cultivate a space around you that allows you to dwell in this not knowing? Uh, it's a space that can become articulate. That often does. It can be very smart, but that. It's got to come out as slow as it needs to come out. Uh, another, another great a family friend told me once, he's an architect, and he works for Moshe Safdi, he's one of the sort of higher, higher echelon architects in the world. Uh, and he said, try not to draw your project too early. You know, try, <laughs> he's giving me advice about some architecture thing that I, I was doing, and he said, keep it in your head as long as you possibly can. You know, don't... Don't put it out there too soon. Try to try to bottle it up and concentrate. And make a tincture from it before you sort of give it out. Which runs totally counter to all teaching uh, that I ever received, but actually feels better in some way. Um, so these are those sculptures I was talking about that ultimately fall down. This is three sheets of steel and one length of kite string. <laughs> uh, and they're sewn together in place uh, with little braces and the braces are removed and it sort of settles uh, and exists in equilibrium until it's disturbed or the natural tension and friction cuts some of the line or it just sort of falls out from under itself um, but it's completely self-supporting uh, and I think it speaks to anxiety and stress and interconnectedness and the internet and all sorts of things. Um, and this was in college. I made a series of these. This one is suspended in air uh, from above. This is two lengths of kite string. It sort of starts looking like a musical instrument, these things. So like this, this banjo quality. Yeah. This is a this is a great this is a great thing this this line and for me the landscape of permission is the studio I have this big beautiful space every time I walk in it feels like putting on a fine suit just you know fits me very well a pair of blue jeans maybe I don't know something I can get a dirty I don't care um, these things start coming out this is called grocery getter. This is uh, pineapple, gold mylar, uh, some pieces of metal, some rods, uh, and this balloon, obviously. It's sort of, I don't know, it reminds me of this, this <coughs> someone going to get groceries. You can't see it on the screen, which is too bad, but maybe you can tell here. This is um, it's a picture frame with uh, fluorescent diffusion. Great. And uh, so look around this room. There are so many frames on this wall. There are lots of paintings, too. Uh, but the frames do so much. Uh, I think a good frame can really make a piece or break a piece. Um, and so I started to think about framing itself. Could you frame nothing? Could you <laughs> could you frame nothing and obscure what was behind it? And still, would it st you know would it still be a piece? Would it still be a work of art in some way? Um, I think so. This is another construction. Instead of two, you know, usually you want a triangle to support something physically, uh, and there is a triangle in this, uh, but there are two pieces here, uh, and I just love the way that the, that that board painted white just disappears into the background. Um, so it's almost just pure line. 
And the photograph, most of my work is momentary, and so photography becomes a very important way to document. And so the photographs almost become the pieces, um, or they become the blueprints at the very least, because if something's been done once and I have a photograph of it, I can usually reconstruct it, but of the event, of the exact moment, whatever, it's almost like, you probably all know Andy Goldsworthy. All, he takes this to a complete extreme. His, his work is so uh, substantial, but it's completely ephemeral at the same point, at the same time. It's always going to be washed away, or it's going to melt, or it's going to fall apart. I think one, he did something for the walker that was just a huge snowball, or no, it was Tokyo or something, but a snowball like this big around. And it, I think it, it took months, I think it was still there in June or something, <laughs> but, but the, finally it melted away. So the, the documentation of it uh, becomes a vital part of the work. Mm -hmm. Uh, and these are on a very, very small scale in comparison. I'm still, uh, you know, working up towards larger occurrences, but uh, that same idea applies. So these are, I'm going to show you just things from the studio today, because I thought, why not? Um, this is my landscape of permission. <laughs> uh, I started working with concrete, uh, and I've been casting styrofoam, throwaway styrofoam containers for new products. Uh, shipping containers um, because they create these incredible forms and I've been working with color uh, and um, you know there's a lot of messiness to things this is a crepe maker I think this came from a printer and so I started two days ago I don't know where this project is going <laughs> but you know I thought I'd share because sort of it's really messy you know things I feel like it's similar for, for everything. Um, but it always feels like the, the, the correct answer is to be working, to be moving, to, 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 be, to be making our way. Yeah. Uh, this is from a book called Are You Working Too Much? <laughs> uh, and I guess it's for artists. Um, artists are at best ultimate freelance knowledge workers. And or is barely capable of distinguishing themselves from the consuming desire to work at all times, and erotic people <laughs> who deploy a series of practices that coincide quite neatly with the requirements of the neoliberal, predatory, continually mutating capitalism of every moment. <laughs> That's a very nice. I, I think it's a very smart statement, um, if a bit pessimistic. Yeah. Um, there is this, you know. I'm working six days a week. I'm not getting paid for any of that work. <laughs> for very little of that work do you get paid. And yet, we feel this, this desire to work all the time. And I think this applies to other creative graphic designers, you know, video producers, um, craftspeople, uh, people who are doing things mm -hmm. for sale all the time. And I think it's easy to get pulled up into a sense of wanting to produce all the time, wanting to make something to be consumed, in a way. And just try to think, oh, there's a lot of images out there. A lot of things out there, there are a lot of objects out there. There's a lot of work done all the time. I guess I'm curious, what do you call work? Is the actual doing that you're talking about? Or is, is it more the, the reflecting? Uh, mm -hmm. Because I think everybody reflects on whatever work they're, they're doing. Right. So I'm trying to understand, are you proposing a different type of, of, or is that statement proposing a different type of environment around work for artists versus hmm. somebody else? I think that statement, hmm. that statement certainly, my interpretation of it is that, in fact, artists are not different from other okay other workers mm -hmm. of all kinds, because we're filled with this feeling you know, that sort of slots in quite nicely. With mm -hmm. In his mind, this is what the world is. It's neoliberal, yeah. predatory, and continually yeah. mutating capitalism at every moment. <laughs> yes. um, but uh, whether or not you believe that, I don't, I don't know. But I think, 
it's an interesting question, you know, is the work the reflection or is it the making or the doing? I think it's maybe the translating or the harnessing, whatever that might be. You know, sometimes you can be actively thinking about something, you can be sort of just remembering, you can reflect, there's so many different qualities and colors and things, which maybe goes without saying, but um, for me, because I can only kind of, I can only speak for myself, I think it's a subjective, it's, it's a harnessing of whatever that great idea was mm -hmm. and moving it and shifting it and pulling it down to a communicable level. I guess, yeah. you're talking about the creative process which comes out of you and which you do inherently for your own satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Take the sticks up against the wall that eventually fall down or get put, put back. Right. I understand that as, as an artistic creation. Do you think about other people's perception of your work? Do you think about how it's going to impact other people, or do you do it solely for yourself? Um, it depends. Yeah, I think I think a lot about what the meaning of something could be. It is about a communication, mm -hmm. something. But it's if it's a successful work. It creates a bit of a new language that can be used. Like the bushes, for example, I think are very successful in communicating a sensitivity to something. Because they're, involved, they're sort of like a mirror. But I think a lot about you know the metaphorical qualities of sculpture. How can it help unlock or open or expand something for somebody? Um, I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to think about what other people think. I guess because it seems like you don't want to be producing for others, you want to be producing for yourself. Uh, I guess that's what other artists seem to tell me I should be doing. Maybe, you know, it's a big balancing act. But that's not the case of the artwork on the wall. Mm -hmm. Right? These artists, presumably, are doing it to share and to spread. Mm -hmm. to, with other people. That seems, I'm assuming that's their inherent wish to Perhaps. share. No. no? Perhaps. Perhaps. Some might, Perhaps. some may not. Mm -hmm. I think of work as having to work to earn my livelihood, to earn mm -hmm. money. But when I paint or do sculpture or any of my art, I am not working. Mm -hmm. I'm not working at all. I really don't care what other people think about it. It is what I, it's just mine. Mm -hmm. If they like it or not, doesn't matter. That's not work. Hmm. I know the difference. Yeah. Well, that's interesting that you have that. I think it's a very, it sounds like a very relaxing and sort of, it's a dropping off of that feeling of having to do Maybe something. Similar. That it becomes just for you. For me, that like cooking can also be that, yes. that way too. I think cooking can be. For maybe more, for a lot more people can do that too. Um, yeah, I think the way I approach it is sort of halfway between. I try to have it be so enjoyable the way that you're talking about that it's it's for me, it's for you. Um, but also, you know, tr trying to do it as a as a practice, as a work. Uh, an enjoyable work, I guess, is the dream. But you're young, and I don't understand that. <laughs> what? Because you have, I think young people have to earn a livelihood for yeah. money. Yeah. And if you're using your art, how do you dismiss the buyers? How do I dismiss the buyers? Not think about them. Well, um, that's easy when there aren't a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to dismiss many of them. <laughs> no, uh, I, you know, I, I do, I do work to make money. Um, mostly, uh, I, I worked in New York City for three years as an architect. Saved up a bunch of money, knowing that I couldn't do it for my life. That it was too, it was too much. Uh, I moved up here and I've been working, living on the fat. Um, 
who want to go out to finances might as well, right? Because um, that's a real that's a real thing. Um, yeah, if something sounds great, if someone else sees something wonderful in it, that's wonderful. It's it's wonderful that they can be a part of that. You know, they can they can help me. It can help them. They can live with it. Um, but I used to say I make a sculpture that's impossible to sell. <laughs> you know, this stuff that just falls apart. <laughs> Try to move it. I'm sorry, you can't have it. You know? um, so, yeah, I'm trying constantly to dismiss that. Yeah. Everyone is an artwork. This is an idea that I that I like quite a bit. We are all creating personas and avatars and whatever of ourselves all the time. Online, for example, I think Facebook is a great example. Um, we are actually creating artworks that are us, but we are also the authors of those artworks. And so, in some way, if we're talking about like a cult of personality uh, that I think pervades a lot of art and media and politics and all kinds of things, you know, politicians, they have whole teams of artists working for them to create their them as an artwork. Um, and artists often are, become artwork. Jeff Koons is a great artwork. He's a fantastic artwork. Uh, and he also makes artworks. And he also, he employs other people at this point to make artworks. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but uh, I like the idea that it unites artists and that there is no distinction between artists and audience members. That in fact we are all uh, artists. Someone said, I forget who it was, that he would, it was Nietzsche, said he would much rather be an artwork than an artist. Because <laughs> artwork, you know, they often live on. Uh, maybe, I don't know why he said uh, So I'm going to show you, I'm going to close with, with images of a show that's up right now uh, called Prototype, which. Um, which is ancient, primitive, Neolithic, Paleolithic forms and tools made with modern day petrochemicals that molecularly will outlast all of us. Uh, some of which will be around for tens of thousands of years. So, you know, having both at the far ends of the spectrum, past and future, sort of brings it to right here and right now. Um, I have a whole rant on uh, time, which could be a different lecture uh, or discussion. Um, but so, prototype. This is uh, a temporary Anglo Saxon shelter, uh, Neolithic period, made with polyvinyl chloride, acrylic, mylar, uh, fluorocarbon, nylon, polypropylene. And a boat uh, that's Viking in shape, sort of uh, Paleolithic Viking, uh, and traditional Alaskan, native Alaskan ribbing and skidding techniques. These are a pair of single seam shoes made from high density polyethylene, which is a plastic bag. Um, they're modeled after. Uh, a pair of leather shoes found in modern-day Armenia, which are thought to be the oldest known in existence. They're 10,000 years old. Mm -hmm. They were these beautiful little boots. You should look it up. They're just incredible. It's like a little video about finding it. It's amazing. This is a coil basket. Uh, it's about a year big. A single polypropylene marine rope. Wound with nylon, and that's a Peruvian stitch on the inside, single overhand, and lazy squaw. <laughs> <laughs> on the left is a bow and arrow, uh, styrene, ultra board, weed whacker line, uh, zip ties, acrylic, and on the right is an uh, axe. It's polyvinyl chloride, it's, it's a uh, can't see it here, but the you know, perforations for uh, it's vinyl siding, uh, polypropylene, nylon rope, and a mirror. Those are the bow, the, the uh, arrows. 
I'm trying to figure out a long time, how, how do you make feathers out of something? <laughs> These are arrowheads, clovis points, um, after the preferential Lavalois flint knapping method, which was discovered uh, in France, in Lavalois, that's why it's called that. Um, this is expanded styrofoam insulation, just a pink panther insulating foam. Um, so they have these, these recent findings have shown that Neanderthals were actually unbelievably smart. Uh, they're sort of the general consensus early on was that they were very, very dumb and stooped over and whatever. Um, but in fact, it was revealed that uh, that first Neanderthal skeleton that was found uh, had arthritis, like horrible arthritis. And so that's why it was stooped. In fact, Neanderthals stood much like us. Uh, they invented the first industrial process and in fact had the language. And the process of flint napping that they developed is partly why they know they had language because it was so complex. They tried to do it, recreate it in labs, and there was no way that they could not have had language to describe it to one another and teach each other. So I thought that was incredible. Inside, you know, in these foam insulation pieces, there are these little fragments of language sort of left over from the carbon. This is a jag dagger and sheath uh, after one that was found on Opsi the Iceman, who is a 5,300-year-old coppersmith that was found by a pair of German hikers. He's buried in ice and freeze-thaw somehow stayed perfectly, perfectly intact. And so he, I was thinking about him as a... As a oh, it's, it's incredible. I mean, he's found with a bow and arrow and a dagger and an axe and money and his clothes, and it was all intact. The dagger was in this macrame sheath. This amazing woven hand macrame sheath that looked exactly like a... Uh, lemon bag. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting to see this because the Zulus in South Africa mm. have taken their traditional weaving and they're now using telephone wire and cable wire and making the most beautiful baskets really? with their original techniques but with all this different colored wire and it's supporting the tribe. So it's easy to punch oh, my house. Go check that out. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Are they doing just baskets? Or are they doing all kinds of things? Well, they're doing bowls and cool. It's beautiful. You should look I will. I will absolutely. Thank you. Where That's is all. This, yeah. this is in uh, in Maine. This in Kittery, which uh, <coughs> about as far south as you can get in Maine. It's a beautiful place, actually, in Kittery. A little town town. A little gallery there, which is gorgeous. Um, yeah, this is Taipar, Taipar tunic and a, a car mat material for this cloak. It's after sort of an Anglo Saxon Gallic design. This is the boat. Uh, yeah, this is a detail of the boat. What did you call the shell? Prototype. Prototype. And this is again this vinyl siding and uh, tight Tyvek rubberized petroleum distillate and nylon. <coughs> this is the uh, so I'm going to close with this quote, which I really enjoy. Without our best intention, attention, the mess can own us. We own the mess when we consider it like collages from various distances. With our most thoughtful scrutiny, the kind we save for art. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna end with. <coughs> I think it's apropos. Uh, this is a self portrait.
geologic history of this region of Vermont. It could be this sort of little time capsule um, to go back in time uh, and understand. So the first phase, which is already underway, is preservation and repair. Uh, we've replaced a bunch of sills, hatches, doorways, bits of lumber. Uh, as of next week, the roof will be complete, entirely replaced uh, and repaired, and it's really moving along very quickly. Um, and uh, and is that a project you're being paid to? If I write a grant, it wouldn't it? <laughs> get paid to do it. Yeah. Um, 
I'm working for a, a nonprofit who owns a structure, the Fund for North Bennington. They're a fantastic resource. They have this, basically they took it upon themselves to archive the photo history of North Bennington. They manage 500 acres of walking trails and, and woods and things. Uh, they're fantastic. Uh, so I work with them. They are the client in a way, uh, but they're also collaborators uh, on the project with design things and whatnot. Um, so this is about, yeah, this is the elevator pitch graphic for sure. Um, then it becomes this landscape interpretation space, uh, and, which would be a little platform inside and a book, uh, a library of archive materials about the farm, about everything that we've been talking about. Um, and then a photo tour, a photo display of people who work on the farm. I found a giant repository of everyone who was working there in the 40s, right. um, including, I mean, names that are in the community, like the Laflamme. Damas Laflamme was a footman at the Parkville House for a long time. But so the idea, really, not in this one. Um, the idea would be to have these displays That's such a great rendering of it. <laughs> Here, I'll show it to you. Um, uh, but basically, a way to talk about landscape through time, uh, in the exact moment. So that's the next phase, in the middle of running a giant grant. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, it's moving along. It will continue to expand and sort of collect information and be a way to talk about the place. Anyway, I think we should probably end. Everyone needs to go.